Welcome to the Second Mind Labs Research Seminar. Uh, today we have Peter Stone. Peter Stone is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin uh, at the Department of Computer Science. He is, I think, very widely known as a reinforcement learning expert. Uh, for me, the first uh, encounter was uh, his uh, RoboCup uh, soccer uh, experiments. Uh, this was really, really fun uh to watch and uh, but for, uh, above all it was it was cool to see uh, like a real world application of reinforcement learning um yeah and uh he's also a founder of a kojitai uh who which recently was acquired if i understand correctly by sony and uh, today it uh, it's uh, uh probably not completely uh, Sony AI, uh, probably there are some other uh, components from the Sony uh, company, uh, but uh, Peter is now also executive director of uh, Sony AI, AI uh, America. Um, so yeah, I'm quite excited to hear uh, what he has in store for us. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, please, you can start. Okay, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction and for inviting me and, uh, and thanks all of you for, for being here. Um, we have a, uh, it's a rel relatively small group, so feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, I don't need to get through everything. Um, and you know, happy to make this into a, into a discussion. But what I have today is, is to, um, to present uh, on the theme of efficient robot skill learning and in particular grounded simulation um, learning and imitation learning from observation. And uh, I'll just take a minute to just tell you all, I am at UT Austin. There's been some really exciting um, times here. The, um, the National Science Foundation in, in the US uh, awarded us one of, of six hubs, national hubs in, uh, in machine learning or in artificial intelligence. Um, ours is on the Institute uh, for Foundations of Machine Learning, um, which we used to found the machine learning laboratory here at UT Austin led by Adam Clivens. And so that's uh, some, um, some great you know, sort of uh, new people coming in and research directions. I'm the director of Texas Robotics. Um, and we just did have a uh, ribbon cutting on a, on a new building, some, a new space. It used to be a gymnasium, as you can see. Um, and uh, it's gonna be sort of a, a playground for all the robots on, on campus. Uh, we just moved in recently. We now have, um, 15 core faculty at, at UT Austin who publish in the main robotics conferences, ICRA, IROS, and RSS, um, across four different departments. So lots of, of ramping up in, in um, robotics, and many of these people are very um, involved in and interested in uh, reinforcement learning as well, including myself, Scott Nikum, um, UK Zhu, and, and others. So, um, so for those of you who don't know me, the, the, uh, my main research question, the one that I've focused on, um, for my whole career, really, um, for more than more than a quarter of a century now, I like to say it's you know I started working in this area before AI was as cool as it is now, um, and it's uh, you know the question is to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and or adversaries in real time dynamic domains, and um, you know so within AI I published in some of the sub areas autonomous agents and multi agent systems robotics especially and uh, machine learning especially reinforcement learning. Um, in my lab, we work both on new fundamental algorithms and, um, and theory of these areas, which I call sort of bottom-up research, but also um, application-driven um, research. And, uh, and, you know, that's I call more top-down. And, um, you know, in a single slide, it's a lot easier to talk about the, uh, the, the application areas. And so when I give this one-slide introduction to my whole lab, I talk about some of these you know, domains that have inspired me over the time. And so in the introduction, it was mentioned um, that I've been involved in these robot soccer competitions. This is from about 15 years ago. Some um, of our robots, the old Sony Ibo robots, um, autonomously playing soccer. They're having to sense, decide, and act. There's no human in the loop. Um, when Sony stopped making those robots, we moved to these, uh, the, the Nows, um, which I know you're all familiar with. Um, or have seen before. This is the uh, a, a snapshot from the finals of a competition a few years ago where we were playing the University of um, Bremen from Germany. Our robots are the ones with their hands behind their back. We put them there so they uh, have, are less likely to sort of bump into the other robots and get twisted in you know different orientations. Um, but again, you have to remember these are all fully autonomous. They're doing the vision. 
the decision making, the actions. Here you see our robot going in on a breakaway, um, and um, the uh, you know they they're um, doing all of this on with on onboard computation, no offboard computation, and so it's all sort of a self-contained agent that has to coordinate with the others. Uh, we went on to win that game four to two, and we're the uh, champions of that league that year. Um, I've also uh, been involved in, I have, if you come to my lab um, at UT, you'll see, you don't you generally have to ask us for a demo. You'll see a robot like this one, just sort of wandering around in the hallways. Um, it's a project we call the Building Wide Intelligence Project, where we try to get this robot to become a part of the social fabric of the building. And so um, the, uh, this particular video is, is talking about some net grounded language learning that I did with a colleague of mine, Ray Mooney, where the robots um, allowing people to interact with it in, in natural language. Uh, people can interact with it in natural language. And if the robot doesn't understand, it asks questions to try to reach an understanding and then improves, it uses that as grounded or as training data to improve its, its understanding of the syntax and semantics of natural language that people, um, people type to the robot. Um, but the robot is you know, also involved in other things like activity recognition and multi-robot path planning and um, social navigation and, and a whole bunch of other things that will allow the robot to just become a general purpose service robot. And, and again, we have tried to have it always on. So you don't have to ask us for the demo. You'll just always, um, always see it. And then I've also been very inspired over the years by autonomous driving. Um, we had, did have a car, this one, in the, in the DARPA Urban Challenge back in 2007. You've all seen videos of autonomous cars, so I won't show you that. We don't actually have that car anymore. All the car companies are investing in this, so we've retired the car. Um, but we've also also thought about what the world will look like when all the cars on the road are autonomous. This is um, a concept that we came up with many years ago on... Um, again, before the urban challenge and before people, so many people were working on autonomous cars, thinking about would we still need traffic signals or stop signs at intersections? Or um, could we have the cars um, call ahead for a reservation in space time? So that's what's happening here. The cars that are white have a reservation in space time through the intersection. The ones that are yellow don't, so they have to stop. Um, but once they turn white, they have a guaranteed path through the intersection, which won't collide with any of the other cars. Um, and, uh, you know, that's in a, a single intersection. Um, it's led to, to many years of research on, you know, what happens if you mix human drivers with autonomous drivers? What if you have, um, you know, bicyclists and pedestrians? What if you scale this up to full cities? And, um, and we are continuing to think about sort of, you know, traffic flow as a multi-agent system and a, and a great domain for, for, um, for machine learning in, in a multi-agent system. So I can give a, you know, a one-hour talk on each of the, on the research that sort of um, stemmed from each of these domains, um, or I could keep a very, you know, sort of high level, um, you know, general talk and just talk about, you know, uh, you know, all the things we do in my lab, but at no level of depth. What I've decided to do today is instead sort of um, zero in on a particular aspect of the research in my lab, which is efficient robot skill learning. And uh, I'll just take a few more minutes to talk about RoboCup. And, and um, since I am currently the president of the International RoboCup Federation, it's really the inspiration for a lot of this. In any of the you know, Robo, RoboCup domains, soccer, or, or also in driving, or also in, in this you know, building-wide intelligence, the robots will need some skills, some low-level skills for motion, for moving, for, you know, for, um, for different things. And so um, that motivates our trying to learn these skills. And I'll talk about two different um, sort of lines of research we've been working on. One is sim to real, which is, and I'll talk about um, uh, a new algorithm or a new approach we call grounded simulation learning, and also briefly talk about its connections to off-policy reinforcement learning. Um, and, uh, and then I'll talk about our work on imitation learning from observation. And in particular, I'll zero in on an, uh, an alg algorithm that we call um, uh, RIDM, or Reinforced Inverse Dynamics Modeling. Um, and you know, I'll dive into the technical details of each of those. Okay, so first, a little bit more about RoboCup soccer. Um, I am, like I said, I'm the president of the, the federation. We have a competition coming up in about a month, June 22nd through 28th. We're going to be doing it for the first time in a sort of distributed online virtual format um, where the teams will be sort of doing challenge events in their own labs and, or else working in simulations. Um, hopefully, we'll be back in person uh, next year. But we have a, a, a long-term goal, which is by the year 2050 to create a team of humanoid robots that can beat the best World Cup champions on a real soccer field. Um, 
I, I'd still say we're in, relative, in the relatively early stages, although every year it gets a little harder to say that. We've been working on it as a, as a worldwide community for, um, for close to 25 years now. Um, there's still 30 years to go, though. There's, it's got many virtues as a challenge problem. You can you know, close the loop and have sensing, deciding, and acting even at the early stages by just simplifying the problem, not working on a full real-sized soccer field yet. Um, the uh, robots, uh, it's, it's um, a good domain for multi-robot systems. It's relatively easy entry to become involved in it, and it's very inspiring. There's, there's a number of different leagues, as pictured here. They all have in common that the um, robots are fully autonomous, no, per, no human in the loop. Um, but to give you a sense of the progress that's happened over the years, in the early years of RoboCup, um, the, you know, it, was, it was a big success those years just to get um, you know, 30 robots all in the same room that were working. And in those days, many roboticists only worked on one part of the robot robotics problem, just the vision or just the motion. And so um, it's a little painful to watch. They're running into the walls, they're falling over. And yet there were some goals scored. Uh, here you see in the top right corner a goal. Um, there wasn't really any opposition from the goalie, but you know, it went into the, in, into the goal. Um, if we flash forwards though, just you know, even fewer than 10 years from there, um, you start to see much better um, individual skills, much better uh, passing and coordination um, in each of these uh, different leagues. Um, I, I think I said, but I should, you know, these are not all my robots. These are you know, from around the world, teams that have contributed and, and they're working in, on, on the problem. Um, in the bottom right corner, it was the first year of the uh, penalty shot competition for the humanoid robots. Now there's full competitions in that league as well. Um, one of the leagues that will feature uh, prominently in this talk is the Simulation League. This is one that my um, uh, team has, has uh, won eight out of the last nine years. Um, it's, a, it's the 3D Simulation League, which is sort of a, it's a physical simulation environment, sort of like a Majoko do domain with a simulator we use is called SimSpark. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's challenging just to get the robots to walk and to kick it with, with high agility. Um, and, uh, but it's also the teamwork. There's 11 on, on 11. This is my student's favorite highlight right here because the, um, the robots uh, managed to, to kick it through the legs of the, um, of the opponent and, uh, and into the goal. Um, but uh, the, you know, we, we introduced sort of our secret weapon here has been a hierarchical machine learning method known as, as layered learning to learn a, a variety of skills from walking to kicking and, and pasting them all together um, in, a, in a sort of a hierarchical way. Um, and then there's also aspects of strategy with 11 robots on each team, these kinds of things. Um, and then finally, I did say, you know, we're trying, the goal is to have robots that can, um, they can beat people. Uh, every year we do have the champion of the middle sized league shown here, um, playing against the, some of the trustees of the RoboCup Federation, myself and some of my colleagues. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, the, ro the people who build the robots always say, oh, they're going to move too fast for you. They're going to hurt you. But it turns out we're still, that even aging amateur soccer players are still able to, um, to beat the robots. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens in the next 30 years. Um, RoboCup isn't just about soccer. There is also domains on general purpose service robots. There's a RoboCup Rescue for disaster rescue, RoboCup Junior for education. I also participate in RoboCup at Home, which is more for these you know, general purpose service robots, um, where we have robots like this Toyota HSR robot that um, has to uh, execute tasks. Oops, what happened? Oh. This sometimes happens. So my computer just froze. So I'm going to need to. I think the quickest thing for me to do is going to be just to reboot the computer, um, and which I apologize for. Um, I don't know why that happens on this video once in a while. Um, so I'll just say that the, the, uh, the, these Toyota HSR robots um, do uh, participate in, the, um, in, in tasks like taking out the trash. If this video were, uh, could continue, you'd see it lifting off the lid. Um, and, uh, and then picking up the trash that's inside in a bag and taking it to the exit. It also has to um, put uh, groceries back on a shelf, put groceries on a shelf, um, like where there's a bunch of groceries on a table, uh, the robot has to, to go and manipulate them, put them away on a shelf where it has to put similar um, objects near each other um, without knowing ahead of time what, uh, what it means to be similar or you know, what objects are similar to others. Um, and um, 
the uh, and then there's also human robot interaction where it has to go to a restaurant and um and take an order from a person um and uh and then and then go i'll show you just in one second um what that looks like so give me one second to just get the presentation pulled up again um uh, second line okay here we go and apologies for that okay share the screen you should be able to see it again um okay i won't play that video again but um but it's yeah because you you know you get the idea it's going to take out the trash here's a here's a picture of the of a restaurant where the robot would have to go up to find a person waving at them go up to the person take their order in natural language pick up the you know if the person says i want the pringles go up to the right object pick it up and bring it back to the person so lots of sort of you know complete challenges here that involve um, planning, natural language processing, vision processing, manipulation, all in one. So it's actually a fantastic domain. I encourage people who are interested. Um, this year, it's actually in simulation because we can't get together physically. So there's a really nice simulator of this, uh, this robot and these kinds of scenarios that it would be, you know, um, uh, relatively straightforward to become involved in. Okay, so that's the that's the motivation of, of RoboCup. Um, the um, and like I say, it's, you know, to, for any of these kinds of tasks, um, you, need to, you need skills, and we'd like to be able to learn those skills. So I'm now going to dive into to some of our research on, on sim to real and in particular, our method on grounded simulation learning, um, where we study reinforcement learning for physical robots. This is joint work with um, two former students, Patrick McAlpine, who's now with me at Sony AI, um, and Josiah Hanna, who's about to be faculty at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And the motivation here is that you know, we'd love to be able to learn skills on the physical robots, um, but this requires supervision. There's manual resets, the robots break, there's wear and tear that makes the learning non-stationary. Um, so it's very natural to want to say, well, let's instead learn in simulation, where we can do thousands of trials in parallel, no supervision is needed, the robots don't break, you can do automatic resets. And so you can, you know, imagine setting up a task like this one, where the robot just has to um, you know, where the robot has to, to learn to walk, move in an agile way, kick, uh, kick the ball into the goal, um, or just, you know, a straight ahead walk policy that, that goes as fast as possible. The problem is if we take the policy, like a, oh, just a walk policy, and take it as it was learned in simulation and put it on the real robot, typically you see something like this. You can execute the policy, but after just one or two steps, it just sort of falls over because, and why is that? It's because the simulator is not perfect. It doesn't model the, the friction right or the contact forces or, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's inevitably, um, there's a reality gap as people call it. And so this motivates the area of sim to real is how can we learn in a simulator um, and have it work in the real environment where you have um, two different environments, the real environment and the simulated environment. You can execute the policy, in, you know, the same policy in either of them. So in other words, the same uh, actions can be sent to the real environment or to the simulated environment. But when you send those same actions, you'll get different resulting next states or different resulting rewards. And so now that's the reality gap. And so there's a number of ways of, there's basically two classes of, of algorithms for dealing with this reality gap. One of them is to um, inject noise into your simulated environment so that you learn a more robust policy with the idea that the, you, know, you hope that the, um, the noise that you see in the um, real environment will be sort of within that, the convex hull of, you know, informally speaking, of the noise that you injected into the, um, into the simulated environment. And, um, and there's been a lot of successful, uh, you know, um, sim to real algorithms in that direction. The other general class of algorithms, and the one that, that the one I'm going to talk about today is a part of, is one where you take some some data from the real world and try to improve your simulator based on that data. Now, the thing that that these these approaches tend to have in common, though, is that their goal is to try to make a perfect simulator. They're trying to make the simulator uh, so that it matches the real world exactly or well enough that you can just um, you know, sort of match the dynamics and learn in the simulator and directly deploy in the real world. Our premise, the premise of our research is that you're never going to be able to build a perfect simulator. There's always going to be this, this gap, at least in the near future, for complex domains with contact forces and things. Um, the, it would be much better to, to try to, to um, 
think locally and try to just improve your sim simulator in a local part of the search space so that um, you can take a policy improvement step um, in the right direction and, uh, and then maybe you know, improve your simulator again in the part of the search space that you're, you're then searching or, or you know, searching at that time. And so we introduce a method called grounded simulation learning that's an iterative sim to real method where um, we first take a real world policy execution to get some data of a policy executing in the real world, collect some trajectories from that execution, use them to ground the simulator, and that's the key step, so I'll go into detail on how we do that in the next few slides. Using that grounded simulator, we can then do reinforcement learning or policy improvement in the simulator, then take that improved policy um, executed in the real world and repeat. And the idea is that you know, each time we do this, we'll, get, we'll ground the simulator to be close to reality in the part of the search space where we're currently searching. Okay, so I said, the key part is, is grounding the simulator. In principle, you could think of a simulator as a model in the context of, you know, in the sense of model-based reinforcement learning, right? It is something that takes in an action and output a state in an action and outputs the next state in a reward. So, you know, it, it, uh, you could just imagine saying, you know, every step of this, um, let's ground the simulator by learning a new model. Um, but in many cases, you have a simulator that's either a black box to you or it's very complex. So the, you know, the RoboCup simulator is open source, so it's not a black box technically, but there's, um, it's non-differentiable. It's a very complex physics-based model. So um, you know, throwing that out and just learning a, you know, a, a function that maps states and actions to the next states would be, would be sort of a waste of, this, of, of all of the engineering that went into this approximate simulator. So instead, we introduce a method that um, that sort of puts a wrapper around the simulator and in particular learns what we call an action transformation function that will transform the actions that come out of a policy so that, um, so that when they get passed into the simulator, the, the, the transformed actions when they pa get passed into the simulator give us the same effects as the original actions would when they were passed into the real world. Okay, so we do this by, by learning a function g. Um, which I'll open up again in the, further in the next slide, but it takes in as the action that the policy um, uh, emits and transforms it into a hat to try to produce a more realistic transition. Um, and and uh, we'll learn this function. To give a sense of what I, what I mean by a more realistic transition, I like to give like this an example. Like say I have um, my, my finger here is, is a, got a joint that's at right now 90 degrees and I send it a command to try to go to 180 degrees. Now, in the real world, there might be a PID controller working underneath that. So when I say in one time step, try to go to 180 degrees, it may only go part of the way, right? So it'll go to 120 degrees. Whereas in the simulator, if I tell it to go to 180 degrees, it may go most of the way, maybe to like, you know, 170 degrees or something like that. And so that's the, the different action effect. So what we want to do is say, when our policy says go to 180 degrees, will actually go to 120 degrees. We want to replace that with an action of maybe go to 125 degrees, because if we tell that to the simulator, it will also actually go 120 degrees, right? So that's what we're trying to do is, is make it so that the, um, the, the new action has the same effect as the original action in the real world. And so we'll do this, um, this function G we learn with two components, a forwards dynamics model of the real world, which takes state action pairs um, outputs the, um, the expected next state in the real world. And then an inverse dynamics model of the simulator, which takes in a state and a next state and learns what the action you need to generate that transition. And so if we, if we then um, transform every action that comes out of our policy into the simulator, we'll get more realistic transitions. So then how do we train these, these forwards and, and inverse models? Um, we use a, you know, as is fashionable these days, we use a deep neural network. We co can collect a relatively small amount of, um, of uh, training examples. So just you know, 15 real world trajectories of a robot walking, each with 2000 state action next state tuples, um, so time steps. Um, so that gives us state action and predicted next state data for the real world. And then for the inverse model, we can take, um, we can get, it's easier to get more trajectories there. They're, they tend to be a little bit shorter, um, but we can get state, 
you know, um, next state and predict and uh, predicted action um, tuples from there and learn these together into a um, into a neural in a neural network. So if we do this, then um, we can use this to ground the simulator in the way that I that I showed you, and we have um, the ultimate goal is to to get a good walk on the real robot. Um, we actually have two simulators that we can use. So we have the the SimSpark simulator from the, from RoboCup, um, and that's where I'll show you the most of our results. But we also have a gazebo simulator, which is a a, a little bit more realistic. So we can, you know in our paper we show all the transfers from gazebo to real world, from SimSpark to real world, and also from SimSpark to Gazebo, where we can gather lots more data because everything is in simulation. So we just pretend that Gazebo is the real world in that case. Um, in all these cases, we applied our, our algorithm, ground, our, our grounded simulation algorithm called grounded action transformation um, to learn fast bipedal walks for this now robot where we started with um, the fastest walk at the time from our colleagues at University of New South Wales. Um, and then we use CMAES, a you know, policy, um, policy-based, uh, population-based stochastic search method um, to improve the parameterization of the, uh, the, the parameters of our um, walk mod, uh, model. And so to show you the, um, the results, uh, the, this is the starting policy, the one that we um, used for the, um, that we got from University of New South Wales. It was the fastest stable walk at the time, um, going about uh, 19 centimeters per second. We use the, the data from that, ground our simulator, learn in the simulator, um, and now after, rather than falling over after two steps, like the earlier video I showed you, it actually learns to a uh, walk for, in the simulator that we can deploy on the real robot that goes 26.3 centimeters per second. We get data from that trajectory, reground the simulator, do a second iteration, and end up with um, uh, a walk that goes 28 centimeters per second. You see it's sort of a little more squat, lay, low to the ground. This is the, was the fastest known stable walk at the time, and it still is one of the faster walks that, that anybody's generated on, the, um, on this robot. So that's, um, that's grounded simulation learning. It's uh, you know, it, it, the, the, the core method. It, it improved the walk speed of, of the now robot by over 40% compared to the state-of-the-art walk engine. Um, and it's led to a whole bunch of, of ongoing work. We did this about three or four years ago. We've been trying to now extend this to other robotics tasks and, and platforms. Other people have started using it. We've been asking questions of when does grounding actions like this work and when does it not? And we've also been looking at um, connections to, um, to off policy evaluation and safe learning. So, so Josiah's thesis basically combines um, the grounded simulation learning method that I just described with some off policy evaluation of reinforcement learning where the, the similarity is um, that in off policy evaluation, you're learning, you wanna take data from one policy and use it to improve or to understand how good a, a, a different policy would be. That's similar to taking data from a simulator, which is different from the real world and using it to improve the policy in the real world. So that's the, um, that's the connection. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a detour and talk about some of these connections to, um, to reinforcement learning. But maybe before I do that, let me pause here and ask if there's any questions about what I've talked about so far on grounded simulation. Okay. And if not, you know, feel like I say, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, you can, I don't know, I think Zoom has a way to raise your hand if you want, or you can just unmute and, and, and say something. Um, but okay. Um, so, Again, this will be a couple of slides of, 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 of you know, completely different non-robotic work focused more on reinforcement learning, um, where we, we've been examining the off-policy policy evaluation problem, where um, in, you know, uh, I think people here are familiar with it in general, but, but the idea is you're given a target policy pi um, and data generated from a behavior policy pi sub b, and we want to estimate the value of pi the, the target policy, which is defined as the expected sum of rewards over trajectories, H, where the trajectories are drawn from your policy pi um, interacting with the real world. Now, you don't have trajectories um, from pi. You have trajectories from pi B in the same environment, but with a different policy. And so the goal is um, to estimate uh, V hat the value of the true value of um, V of pi. 
And the metric we use to say how close we are is mean squared error on a state by state basis between the value of uh, the true value of the policy pi and our estimate um, v, uh, v hat. So the, the general method for doing this that is, is popular and, and well known is important sampling. Um, and uh, you know, so the, uh, the important sampling transition is that you reweight your reward totals for each trajectory in the observed data. Um, so if you have some um, trajectories H generated by your behavior policy pi B, you want to transform them to the value um, that you would get from trajectories um, generated by, um, by pi. Um, we can do that by uh, the following, term, following expression, which has two terms. The total rewards of those trajectories, the, you know, the sum of rewards over the, the, um, the trajectories, reweighted by their relative likelihoods um, of, the, of seeing an, an action when you're executing pi relative to the, action, the probability of seeing that action um, when you were executing pi b. And then you can take the average of these weighted reward totals to get your estimate of um, the value of pi. So without going into all the mathematical details, there, these are in a, couple, a series of ICML papers that we've, we've published. We've sort of debunked two um, myths that, that were, were um, sort of popular within at least the reinforcement learning community. And, and important sampling is studied also in statistics and in, in other, other areas. Um, but in reinforcement learning, it was often uh, thought that the target policy is the optimal choice of behavior policy to collect data for important sampling. And it says so in the Sutton and Barton, Barto book. It says, um, you know, if you can get data from the policy you really care about, that's, of course, what you should do. Um, but sometimes you don't have that, that policy and you have to use a, a different policy. Um, and it turns out that, that uh, you know, and it's not too hard to see from a statistical point of view, that, that, it, that you could, especially in a situation where you have rare events, that you might want to run a behavior policy that's different from the target policy um, that upweights those rare events so that you see them more frequently um, and then use important sampling to reweight them. This will minimize the variance of important sampling estimates. And it turns out that if you know the actual values of the um, the actions and and the and the the two different policies, their relative. Um, if you know their values and you know their um, behavior probabilities, that you could you can create a behavior policy that uh, with just a single trajectory has zero variance on the value of this um, on your of your target policy. Uh, by just you know perfectly upweighting and downweighting the probabilities of actions so that they all every trajectory every outcome probabilistic trajectory has the same um, the same value or the same um, return and so based on this intuition we actually introduced an algorithm that that searches that finds a behavior policy that gives um, lower variance important sampling estimates we call it behavior policy search um, and uh, and show that it can um, it, uh, measurably reduce the sample complexity of um, off-policy policy evaluation for reinforcement learning. And then in, um, in some more recent ICML papers, we looked at a, a second myth of, of important sampling, which is that the true behavior policy should be used to compute the denominator of the importance weight. So for example, if I'm flipping a coin you know, that, that's heads and tails with equal weight, um, which we know is a fair coin, so it's 50% each, you know, heads, 50% tails. But in the data I get when I was running my behavior policy, I saw six heads and four tails. It leads to the question of should the denominator of the important sampling be 60, you know, 60% heads, 40% tails, or should it be 50-50 because we know that's the true, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the true probabilities for the behavior policy. Um, it turns out, you know, and I think you know, it was, was, I think, conventional wisdom that if you know the true behavior policy, you should use it. It turns out that if we replace um, the behavior policy, even when it's known, with an estimate of the policy, um, which is you know, an incorrect estimate, but is the, the maximum likelihood one for generating the data that you saw, that will um, lower the variance of your important sampling estimates as well. And so, and so we were able to prove that, that using an estimated behavior policy has asymptotically lower variance um, than using the true behavior policy. Okay, so um, 
again, feel free if, to, to interrupt if, if there's questions. If, you, if that part, you know, uh, if you didn't follow part, parts of those slides, that's fine, because I'm now going to pop back up to, um, to some of the, you know, robotics-related work and, and the skill learning, but that was just sort of an aside of some of the, um, the sort of foundational, fundamental results that, that uh, have resulted from, um, from this, this line of research. Okay, so um, I did introduce grounded action transformation. Um, we have extended it um, I'm in a couple of ways in some very recent papers at IROS 2020. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into full detail on these. I'm just going to give you a sense of two different extensions, one um, called RGAT and one called SGAT. Um, uh, I have, like I said, if I were going to only talk about this and not about the one other topic in this talk, I would go into more detail here. But I'll just tell you that the um, one of the limitations of, of GATT that I, as I've presented it to you so far, is that it learns to transform actions one step at a time, right? So it tries to make the, the action that comes out of the simulator be the same as the action that comes out of the, um, the real world on a step-by-step -step basis. But in practice, we actually care much more about trajectories than individual steps. It might be that we were okay with the simulator doing a bad, you know, a bad transition now if it will help us lead to full trajectories that have good, tra uh, good transitions. And so uh, with that perspective in mind, we've um, also done some research where instead of using this forward model and inverse model and putting them together, we've um, changed the agent environment boundary to try to make the action transformer itself be the agent. And in some sense, what it's trying to do is learn how to transform actions such that you get not just single steps, but full trajectories out of the simulated environment that match the um, trajectories that come out of the real environment. And so this is, in a sense, a, a reinforcement learning problem. There's delayed reward, delayed feedback. Um, we don't just get reward from is the transition, does it match the real world now? But how does it match the real world, you know, two steps from now and three steps from more now and, and so on. And, um, and without going, you know, to the details are in the paper, but, um, you know, we found that that in some cases has leads to better results, which I'll, which I'll skip over here. Um, the, uh, the other thing we've looked at is that um, the models that we've learned so far have been um, deterministic models. And, you know, assume that, that when you ex execute an action, it'll do the same thing every time. And in this video, we put some bumps, some, some foam underneath the carpet so that the, the transitions are no longer deterministic. They're stochastic. Sometimes the step, you know, the, the foot will move forward smoothly. Sometimes it'll run into a bump. And so if we just use uh, GAT as I described it, it won't work because we've, we had assumed that both the forwards model and the inverse model were deterministic models, that, that if you executed a, from a state an action, you would get to a particular next state. Um, whereas in the real world, you might have stochastic transitions. And so by uh, augmenting our models that we learn in as a part of GET to be stochastic models, um, we are able to, um, to learn to walk in these stochastic environments. And so in this video, on the right, you'll see the, the original method um, where it's, we assume deterministic models. On the left, um, some walks where we've learned a stochastic um, model. It's a little bit slower on flat ground but it's much more stable in the stochastic environment. And you see in four of these five trials, it makes it from the start to the, to the end successful. And so that's just you know, sort of some of the research that we've uh, been, been um, pursuing to, to extend, um, extend this, this research on uh, grounded action transformations. Okay, so that brings me to the, um, to the second sort of uh, technical uh, direction for efficient robot skill learning, which is imitation learning from, from observation. And, um, and here we've, um, we've actually introduced a bunch of different algorithms for imitation learning from observation. The key feature of imitation learning from observation is that you're given a demonstration, but you don't know what actions generated that demonstration. You just get to see the state sequence. Um, and I'll go into details on that in a second. We've done a a model-based behavior cloning method called behavior cloning from observation, um, a model-free generative adversarial imitation from observation method that we call GIFO. Um, sometimes when I give this talk, I, I, I dig into those. Um, in this case, I'm going to talk about a, a different method that we call that, that combines imitation learning and reinforcement learning. 
um, into a method that we call reinforced inverse dynamics modeling, or um, RIDM. And this, is, uh, this was also in, in IROS 2020, um, joint work with the people you see here. Brahma Pavsi was a master's student. Faraz Tarabi, who just last week uh, defended his PhD thesis and is now um, on, the, on the job market looking for industry positions. Um, Josiah Hanna, who I already mentioned, is going to be at the University of Wisconsin, and Garrett Warnell, who's a researcher at Army Research Lab. And um, so I'm actually going to switch to a different uh, machine to show you this um, because it shows better on a Mac. Um, so uh, just go to slideshow. Um, so where do I do that? Um, view. No. Um, yeah, shoot. I had this showing before. Oh, there's the slideshow button. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, and the motivation here is is to uh, allow the AI AI agent to to learn tasks when we have a demonstration. The reward function is available. The demonstrator may be suboptimal, um, and the demonstrator actions, as I just described, are not available. Um, and maybe there's only one demonstration trajectory. Or there's very few. Um, involved uh, with only the raw state information. So I've already, you already know about reinforcement learning, so I will, I'll skip through the, the introductory slide to reinforcement learning. This is just the standard uh, slide of what reinforcement learning is. Imitation learning, um, I must assume many of you are familiar with this as well, but the goal here is to learn how to make decisions to try to imitate another agent. Um, usually the observations consist of state action pairs, um, but that precludes using uh, videos, large amounts of, of demonstration data. Um, so, but this is this is a video from my colleague Scott Nikom is sort of you know uh, imitation learning as usually done. A person is giving a kinesthetic demonstration, you know, manually moving the arm around, um, and so the robot can then store the states and the actions um, that that would generate um, the the correct behavior. Imitation learning from observation, on the other hand, we want to be given um, state only demonstration. So this is a video I like showing. Um, if you watch the bird and you watch the people, um, there's no access, you know, if, if the bird is imitating the people here, it has no access to what actions the people are using in their joints. It actually has a different body, it, but it's somehow imitating getting the same behavior. Um, somebody pointed out to me that it might not be that the bird is imitating the people. It might be the people that are imitating the bird, but then the same point applies. Uh, no, I actually have no idea which one it was here. Um, but, uh, and so the formulation is that now we're given a sequence of, of states that is the demonstration, and we want to learn a policy that would map states to, this, to actions that would um, give us the same kinds of sequence of um, trajectories. And so there's been a lot of work in this space, both in reinforcement learning, in imitation learning, in um, the intersection between imitation learning and reinforcement learning. Um, and also imitation from observation. So we're not the first to, to be looking at, uh, at that. Um, but what this really is, is gonna talk about this particular piece of work is to use imitation from observation and reinforcement learning together in a, in a new paradigm to, to blend them. Um, and uh, so, so we're gonna combine um, this IFO and, and reinforcement. And so again, we'll be given a single uh, suboptimal demonstration um, and the reward function, which will allow us to, to bring in reinforcement learning. You don't always have the reward function when, you, um, when you're doing imitation learning. And so we want to learn the policy to perform the task, not necessarily to imitate uh, the person. We want, we're going to use the imitation to help us learn the task better and get a high reward. So um, our algorithm is called reinforced inverse dynamics modeling, and it works as follows. So um, it, it's... Uh, it will take a fixed demonstration coupled with the a, a parameterized inverse dynamics model. And the demonstration is treated as fixed. And then the reinforcement learning is gonna learn an inverse dynamics model that causes attempting to follow the demonstration to lead to the highest environmental reward. So we're gonna, it's really the environmental reward we care about. We don't care about being close to the demonstration, but we're gonna leverage the demonstration in a way that I'll make clear on this slide. So, um, so say you have the expert trajectory. It starts in state zero, um, moves to state one, um, it then goes to state two, it then goes to, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, 
you know, state over time. That's, that's, the, that's the demonstration we're given. Now, we have some model. It could be a, you know, a PID controller. It could be a, you know, a, a, a model in the reinforcement learning model sense um, that, that tries to tell us if we are in um, state uh, S0 and we want to get to S1, what action should we execute? Um, and it's a parameterized model. But the thing is that it's not perfect, right? So when we execute the action that the model tells us to, we get the red um, transition. So, and then if we, you know, from there, we try to plan to the next demonstrator state using our model, um, but we actually get the, this red transition and so on. We can continue on like this and we would get a red trajectory that we can evaluate using our reward function. Now, the thing that determined what our red trajectory was, was our yellow, the yellow model. And so, and if we change that model, it will lead us to a different trajectory, right? So if we change our, our inverse dynamics model, it will lead us to you know, one of these three red trajectories. And we want to select the one, the model that leads us to the actual trajectory that has the highest reward. And so that's the, um, you know, that's the general objective or the general setup. And so our steps, we're going to in initialize this inverse dynamics model. We're going to pre-train it by collecting data using an exploration policy. Then we're going to use um, the inverse dynamics model on the current state of the agent and next state uh, of the expert to calculate the next action, as I just illustrated. Then we execute the action and collect the reward and, um, and then train the IDM to, to maximize the reward and, and return back to, to step three. And so, um, and so if we do this, we have a bunch of, uh, you know, we can, we can show this working in a bunch of different domains, the Majoku simulator or in the, the RoboCup 3D SimSpark simulator that I've already showed you or on a real robot. Um, and so, and our hypothesis is that, uh, that our IDM will be able to learn tasks efficiently with comparable performance compared to the demonstrator. Um, and if the demonstrator is uh, suboptimal, that it could actually perform, learn to outperform the demonstrator because it's, uh, you know, eventually trying to um, maximize the environmental reward. So um, I've already introduced this simulator to you, so I'll skip through this slide. Um, there are a bunch of teams that use it. Um, so one of them is called Foot K, one of them is FC Portugal. Um, we have, we don't have access to their source code, so we don't know how they generated their walks and their kicks. But we do get access to videos or, or, or traces of the behaviors. Um, and so we may, you know, we may say, well, we want to take their behavior. We don't know how they generate it. We want to use it to learn a behavior that's similar. Um, and so, um, so our experiments uh, actually can, can do show that we out, outperform the suboptimal experts. So here on the left, um, the bottom is the demonstration walk. And the top is the learned behavior, and you see it moves a little bit faster. Um, and then here's a different demonstration walk on the, on the right from FC Portugal. Um, it's learning a different style because it's now uh, you, trying to match a different demonstration. Um, but again, it's able to learn a walk that's, that's slightly faster. And then similarly, we can do the same thing for, um, for kicking. So here's a, a demonstration kick on the bottom. A learned kick here, you can see very clearly that the learned kick goes even farther than the, the demonstration kick. Um, but doing it in a, a style that's, that's similar to or motivated by the, the demonstration that we had available. And again, we can do this both with the Futke and with the FC Portugal skills. Um, and then, um, and then on the, uh, we can apply this in the real world as well, where um, uh, there's, uh, the, the robot has a default PID um, controller where if we, you know, we have a demonstration of a pushing task like this, if we try to just mimic that using a PID controller you know, where it's trying to go to the states that, the, that it observed from the demonstration, it ends up knocking over the bottle. Um, but if we use our IDM to try to learn a, you know, to, to tune the gains of the PID uh, controller so that we get the, um, the right, uh, you know, a model, that, that matches the demonstration as well as possible, we see successful behavior. So the summary here is that, uh, that you know, it's, a, it's a, I think it's sort of a new class of algorithms in some sense. It's a new way of combining imitation learning with reinforcement learning um, that augments uh, um, 
each of them. It requires only one state only demonstration. It can outperform a sub uh, a suboptimal demonstrator and um, is joint work with all of the um, all of the people that I um, showed here. So let me go back to to the screen. So um, so that's basically what I wanted to uh, to talk about. You know, just to remind you my. My, of my research question and the uh, and the areas um, that that I covered, you know, especially this is a, this talk was about robotics and reinforcement learning. Um, it wasn't I didn't uh, you know I didn't uh, dive into much of our the multi agent systems um, work in my lab. Um, there's been a lot of other things in my lab uh, you know, in reinforcement learning we've done. Um, also, learning from positive and negative feedback rather than demonstrations. So also human interactive um, uh, learning. We introduced an algorithm called Tamer for that. We've done a lot of work on transfer learning for reinforcement learning, and most recently a curriculum learning where an agent has to decide for itself what tasks to practice on for transfer learning. And that was the PhD thesis of Sanmeet Narvikar uh, just uh, last month. And um, we've also used reinforcement learning for playlist recommendation, uh, recommendation for uh, learning on, um, on physical robots um, in, a, in a sample efficient way and also um, deep reinforcement learning in continuous action spaces. All of these things are, are sort of you know, uh, contributions to the reinforcement learning community. And also um, have done a lot of work in, in multi-agent systems. And you know, if, I, if I were gonna focus this talk on um, multi-agent systems, I probably would tell you a lot about our work on ad hoc teamwork, where our goal is to create a teammate that can work well with other teammates that it's never seen before. So like, you know, a person can go play a pickup game of soccer. I can go and play with people I've never seen before. Um, and immediately we sort of model each other, figure out what positions we should play and, uh, you know, and sort of merge into a, a team. We'd like to be, uh, to make it so robots can do that as well. And, uh, you know, if there's a disaster, like an earthquake, if a bunch of people from around the world bring robots, we don't have to reprogram them to be a team. They can just each figure out for themselves how to be a good team player with, um, with new teammates. And, uh, and so we've introduced this as a triple AI challenge problem. We've done experiments in a number of domains, including in RoboCup, um, where there have been sort of drop in, uh, pick up soccer games. Um, I don't I won't show the video there. Um, but, but this is, and this has been a, a big theme of, of research in my lab over the years as well. But in this talk, I focused on efficient robot skill learning, um, in particular grounded simulation learning and imitation from observation. Um, and uh, spoke, focused specifically on the grounded action transformation algorithm with its connections to off-policy reinforcement learning and um, the reinforced inverse dynamics modeling um, as an imitation learning from observation uh, algorithm. So with that, um, thank you for your, for your attention and for being here. And I'll be ha more than happy to, to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Peter. That was a whirlwind tour through quite a few topics. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, sure. So, well, actually, I have the about the last uh, uh, topic that you discussed: uh, our, our rhythm, <laughs> mm -hmm. learning from observations. It seems like in some ways it's uh, connected to uh, offline reinforcement learning uh, problem, uh, but where you don't really observe actions. So it's like even like a verse situation where you don't observe actions, you just have observations. That's right. And you're still trying to learn a, a good policy or better policy than what uh, the policy that has produced the observations. Right? That's right. Yeah, and that's that's I think, and that that's sort of um, con or characteristic of imitation learning in general that you you have a demonstration, you have you know sequ uh, you know state actions, but usually you don't assume in imitation learning that there's a, um, that, that you have access to the real reward function. You either you know, do inverse uh, reinforcement learning where you, you know, in, um, reverse engineer what the, you know, what the likely reward function was and then optimize that, or you do um, uh, behavioral cloning kinds of things. Um, so this is, you know, I think it's definitely connected to all imitation learning. And so in that sense is this sort of off policy or off, um, yeah, off policy reinforcement learning in a sense. Um, but now we have, we do have this, you know, the reward function that we can try to optimize towards, which is different from, you know, it's, it's sort of a hybrid between off policy reinforcement learning where you do have a reward function and imitation learning where you don't. 
right. No, no I see this as a quite a quite an important step uh, stepping stone for uh, making reinforcement learning work in on real world, real world problems. Uh, so far, we had uh, uh, well, there hasn't been so many successes about uh, transferring what we see in uh, papers to uh, solving real world uh, problems. Uh, I, Sergey Levine is one of the proponents of uh, like pushing hard for uh, improving our offline reinforcement learning where you get like a fixed data set and right. uh, improving the policy uh, based on just a fixed data set. Uh, but yeah, mutation learning seems like it's going to be important uh, component as well. Yeah. And so I guess, you know, of the things I talked about, the, the, the off policy reinforcement learning work, that's definitely fixed data set. That was batch off policy reinforcement learning. And um, uh, rhythm was, is, um, it's a fixed data set in the sense that you only have the single demonstration and you don't, um, you know, you don't get to improve from that. Uh, or you don't get to get more demonstrations, but you do have interactions in the environment. So in both grounded simulation learning and rhythm, there is, uh, you know, um, data right. and there's bat, you know, that, that you can generate during the learning process. So really the only purely offline thing that, that I talked about was the, the more theoretical RL stuff. I think Vincent has a question. You have your hand up. Yes, hi. Yes, I do. Thanks for this uh, great overview. Super interesting. Um, something a lot of us work on is, um, is actually trying to encode uncertainty, whether it's uh, data uncertainty, but, well, uncertainty coming from lack of data or inherent uncertainty in the, in the environment. Um, is that something you're typically concerned about in your applications? And what kind of models are you using or have you used over, over the course of your career, let's say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've used a lot. I mean, uncertainty is, is key. And we've done a lot of work on, on you know, with using PalmDP models. And, um, and uh, you know, because if, if it's partially observable, there's uncertainty. Um, the, uh, some of the, this line of work, I, which I only, you know, touched on briefly with, with Scott Neekum and Josiah Hanna on off-policy um, reinforcement learning, we do uh, we do have a paper where we characterize it as a, as, as a safe reinforcement learning problem where we're trying to come up with a policy that is, you know, in, a, in an epsilon delta, you know, in a pack sense is, uh, you know, probably 95%, um, you know, within 95% of optimal, that kind of thing. And so we're looking at, you know, sort of, uh, we use bootstrap, bootstrap statistical methods to, to say, you know, in, um, actually, I can say that the, the nice, um, an approach that we introduced was, was, basically bootstrapped models where we have a bunch of data in this off policy, off policy data, use subsets of that data to learn models, to learn a model, uh, different models, and then learn using reinforce a model based reinforcement learning algorithm with those different models. And then um, say that, you know, the, the value of an action um, we can calculate based on the, you know, the percentage of times that it, you know, basically the statistical performance um, assuming each of those different models. So that's one way that we've done, that we've dealt with uncertainty. We call it bootstrapped models um, for model-based reinforcement learning. I think it was an AMOS paper in 2017. Um, so that's, that's one way, but, but yeah, any kind of robotic environment is always, you know, you've got sensor uncertainty, so perceptual uncertainty, and that's, you know, sort of um, can be thought of, you know, as a, in a PomDP sense, you've got action uh, uncertainty, that's sort of what we're dealing with with grounded simulation learning in our IDM is that there's uncertainty of what the, you know, what's actually going to happen uh, when you execute an action. So um, yeah, I mean, I think uncertainty pervades almost everything we've done when we've tried to get it to work on, on real robots. Um, the, what, I guess one of the algorithms I mentioned really briefly was uh, Todd Hester's PhD thesis was the text floor algorithm. Um, which was uh, dealing with uh, planning to explore in a way to, to reduce uncertainty. Um, the sort of the key demonstration at the end of that was we had, uh, we applied it on this real autonomous car where it's trying to learn to um, keep a particular speed. Um, and it does it in just two and a half minutes of real time data and, um, and exploration where it sort of plans for itself 
you know, should I, I want to figure out what happens when I press the accelerator, when I press the brakes, when I go from five miles an hour to, eight, you know, when I'm in different places, it plans to get to those states, figures out a model, and then, um, and then is able to very quickly get to, you know, a, a policy where it can um, hold 30, 30 miles an hour. Um, and, uh, and this was all about, you know, trying to, um, you know, it's sort of, sort of related to the, you know, the go explore kinds of things and, you know, sort of, uh, uh, motivated also by Bayesian reinforcement learning, but in a tractable way, trying to plan to get to states that will reduce your uncertainty about the models. And so, um, I think that the, you know, Todd's, uh, Texplor article is probably one of the, one of the best ways to see, you know, that, um, there's a machine learning journal article that, that goes through Texplor in a comprehensive way. And that's, uh, just to interrupt, uh, so that's, you're using a probabilistic model there of the uh, dynamics or you're again using some kind of ensemble method that you're using? It was not, so we were using a decision forest. So it was an ensemble method uh, where we had different, you know, different decision trees. Um, and, uh, and then each model was, uh, each of the decision forests was trained with a different subset of the um, the data that had been stored from from past exploration. So, um, so it's sort of you know almost ensemble at two levels. A decision forest by itself is an ensemble method, and then we had an ensemble of of decision forests that uh, that we would use to sort of um, estimate the the probabilities. Um, but yeah, this was this was actually done before the. I guess we started it all before the deep learning revolution. So, you know, now, now we might've used a different model, but, but actually for the amount, you know, to be sample efficient, we didn't, we wanted to be able to train quickly with a small amount of data. The decision forest was, was, it might still be the, the method of choice if we went back and revisited it. I think John has a hand up. Yeah, John. Uh, hi, yeah, so uh, thanks very much. That was a, a really interesting talk. Um, so when you were talking about uh, this, um, combination of real world and simulated data and sort of iterating between the two to improve the walking speed of the robot, um, starting with mm -hmm. the, the New South Wales policy and then improving on that. Um, did, was there, a, was there a, a, a cost involved in improving the walking speed? I mean, it, earlier on when you're talking about ro walking robots, you're talking about their agility. Is there, was, was the faster robot worse at cornering or something? Was, was there a trade-off involved? Yeah, that's a great question. So, in fact, you know, we, the motivation for this was to use it in the, um, the robot soccer competitions, because obviously if you have a faster robot than anybody else, you're going to, you know, it's like if you have a team that runs versus a team that walks, you're going you're gonna to have an advantage. Um, it turns out that uh, on the physical robots, that walk was much more, um, it, it uh, heated up the, the motors, it taxed the motors much more than the, the New South Wales walk. And so the, the motors would overheat if we use that walk too much. Once they overheated, the robot would start falling over and no walk would work. So, um, so there was a cost in terms of the, you know, the performance on the robot. We could only execute that walk for short periods of time. So then, you know, so we did, you know, sort of uh, use it for sprints once in a while. Um, it's sort of like, you know, it's stamina thing, you know, the people get tired if they sprint too much, uh, we had to start thinking of it as something we could only use sparingly this fast walk. And yes, it was only good for straight ahead. It was trained for straight ahead, um, you know, to get, to go, you know, to start being agile and you know, changing directions and things like that. Um, it needed to, uh, we needed to go back to the older, you know, to an older policy that was, was you know, slower. So, so yes, there is a very, very much a cost to, you know, to different walks. And we have to think about that a lot. In fact, in the simulation league, which um, I think I, I showed earlier on, um, when we did tasks like this one, um, let me go back to it. Oops. Uh, so we actually um, very early on learned a very fast straight ahead walk for this, uh, for the robot. And I'll stop it here for a second. One that like went, um, almost twice as fast as all of the other robots in this simulator. And, and my student, Patrick, at, at, at the time came and, and said, we're going to win the competition this year. We have a walk that's twice as fast as everybody else. And, um, but it turned out that, uh, you know, that fast walk was very bad at, at turning corners or slowing down. Every time we tried to do anything other than fast, it would, it would fall over. It was completely incapable of doing what you see in this video, which was, you know, changing direction and staying behind the ball. And so that's what motivated this, the, the, the core, one of the core methods of his thesis, which was layered learning, where 
we would learn, you know, so that first year we ended up not doing well in the competition because our robot was fast but couldn't do anything else. But then the next year we went back to the drawing board and figured out how to learn the fast walk and then, um, but then create reward functions and objective functions that, uh, that you know, would in lead to behaviors more like this one. So we first, um, you know, uh, we would train it to actually learn a walk that could dribble the ball, not just walk straight. Or we would train it to, um, I have a whole presentation on this that I've given in, in the past, where we train it to, to like, you know, do curving trajectories or to do backwards trajectories and all of these things and try to learn. Um, and then it also turns out that transitioning from a walk to a kick is difficult. And, and so being able to learn these skills in tandem um, required a lot of ingenuity. And that's, that's what the layered learning method allows us to do. And so, yes, uh, you know, you, your question is very insightful. It's, you know, just, just being able to, to have a skill that can, be, that can execute in isolation doesn't by itself mean that you're going to be able to put it together into a, um, into a robust behavior for what you ultimately care about. And we've dealt with that a lot over the years, both on the simulator and with the real robots. That's awesome. Thank you. I think you're muted if you're, uh, I think you're talking, Herve. You're muted though. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so I think the, uh, we are out of time for the, at least official time for the seminar, uh, but uh, Peter was generous with his time. He has a bit more uh, uh, time on disposal for us. Uh, so feel free to uh, stick around for, uh, if you have a few more questions. Uh, otherwise, yeah, feel free to jump off the call. Uh, I, I do actually have a follow-up question, actually, if, if that's right. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, well, no, not really a follow-up question, I suppose, a different question. Um, so when you're talking about the, the myths of uh, important sampling and um, you have been able to uh, demonstrate that they're not true, um, are you, are you suggesting that like, some of these very, very complicated methods that try to work around um, the sort of ex various explosion, like um, like Facebook AI has this magic algorithm, uh, where the acronym is magic, and uh, it, it's, it's a very complicated algorithm, but they're, they're trying to avoid the problem of um, large variances. Uh, are you suggesting that everything in, that's been done in that kind of direction is uh, um, misled? actually not necessarily so so some of these the the um the insights of, of like you know i mean important sampling is at the core of all, of many different methods and um in our papers we actually show that that the insights that i talked about here can be combined with lots of different important sampling based methods and can improve their sample efficiency almost for free so by you know, changing the denominator of the of the important sampling estimate to be an estimate rather than the true behavior policy, um, or by you know uh, that that's the one that is you know basically for free. If you're if if you're using the true behavior policy as your denominator, just replace it with the the maximum likelihood estimate of the of the behavior policy, and any other method you're using, ought to improve. And we show that with like three or four different approaches in our paper. Um, and so, you know, in that case, I would say if they've got, you know, that magic, if they're using important sampling at, the, at any aspect and they're using the true behavior policy in the denominator, we're just saying replace it and you'll get a boost. Um, I haven't tried it with, with magic, so I can't say that with, you know, with authority. But um, and then the other behavior policy search, I think, is is um, it's a little more, um, you know, specialized. But if 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 you are selecting what your behavior policy is if you have that as you know, if the algorithm that you're dealing with allows you to um, to select the behavior policy then we do provide a method for for doing that in a in a uh, principled way which you know i think many people don't they just say your behavior policy is given or you know or you want your behavior policy to be as close as possible to your um target policy um which is not turns out not to be true and so so you know i'd say these are these are general fundamental principles that could be uh, used to improve existing methods. I wouldn't say they're, you know, complete algorithms that require you to throw out other things you're doing. They're more, you know, things to leverage within your algorithms. 
Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. I was actually a bit, a bit surprised with the uh, with your statement for the denominator. So how come that uh, that's uh, that's true? Can you give some intuition? Yeah, so it's hard to give the intuition. The uh, the intuition for the first myth is, is a lot easier. The the rare events, you know, upweighting rare events. The the intuition for the second one is, I, I think you know, it's, it's, it, we we do discuss it in the paper. So first of all, I would you know encourage you to go to the ICML paper to to um, to look at that. The best I can do in sort of a you know informally is is that I think of it as as the the actual data that you saw in some sense doesn't it, it could have been generated from any number of different policies right so so think about just intuitively if um if i flipped a fair coin and i got seven heads and three tails or i flipped a biased coin that's 70 percent, 30 percent, and got seven heads and three t tails it's still the same data set right it's still telling me the same um the, it's giving me the same information about the real world in terms of um, the uh, the trajectories that I would see. And it, it, it's just one of them has sampling error. So I get. I mean, maybe this is one way of thinking of it: is that when you're doing important sampling, there's multiple sources of error. One is the difference between the the um, the behavior policy and the target policy. The other is the sampling error when you sample the behavior policy. And so, like the uh, if you can, if you pretend that the policy is actually reflect the maximum likelihood policy for the real data, then you're essentially saying the behavior data has zero sampling error, right? It's per it's per a perfect reflection, and so now the only error is um, you know is uh, is the error in the behavior gener you know is, is in the stochasticity of the of the environment, right? There's environmental stochasticity and there's sampling behavior in the in the uh, behavior, and we're basically eliminating by, by chain re replacing the denominator. You're, you're making it so there's zero sampling error. Um, it, it's it's uh, you know I, I think the thought experiment I like to do is is saying you know that that, that um, the you know if you got the same trajectory from a fifty fifty coin or a seventy thirty coin, why would well, like why would what would knowing the behavior policy what should that do to your, you know, um, knowledge of, of what ha happens as a result of those trajectories? And I don't think it should do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't provide you any extra information to know what process generated that, that, those trajectories. Um, it just matters what pro likely, you know, probability distribution you actually saw of those trajectories, of, of, those, um, of those actions. No, it's clear enough. It's a, um, it's a sloppy, it's, it's, it's a, it, it's I know it's a little hand wavy, but we we try to be as clear as we can in the paper. So so yeah, it's it's it is that one is is I think tends to be more is you know particularly surprising to people. But but we have a nice proof in the paper. Okay, I'll check it out. But if somebody else has a question, <laughs> please. Yeah, I have a quick question. I think it, it's probably not that technically complex, but you kind of talked about how you deal with uncertainty when you're training. Uh, the agents, but how, how do you deal, how do the agents themselves deal with uncertainty? So once they're trained, are the robots themselves kind of risk aware? Would they like kind of have like an ideal move they would want to do, but then realize that, that it's risky. So it would only kind of get them to where they want to go with 50% chance. Uh, and and can yeah. you, is that something you can tune sort of how risky that, that they, that sort of the risk they're willing to, to accept? Yeah, and and you know, we've used. I mean, in, in these um, in the domains I talked about today, there isn't that. You know, it's not really that doesn't come up so much. It's it's um, you know, it's more. Uh, you know, you're trying to get a high expected value policy, um, but in multi-agent domains, it it's always about uh, you know about risk and models of the other opponents. So in, in like you know, um, so then you're not just trying to maximize your expected value. There's you know you can do uh, you know use CVAR and you know, conditional variable variance at risk. You can, um, you know, you, you can, we've, we've looked in, in sort of auction based settings where we've built trading agents, um, you know, looked at, at, you want to, you know, if there's a threshold performance, you want to maximize the performance you're above this threshold rather than maximizing your expected value. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of methods in multi-agent systems for, for, um, for, you know, having agents that reason about um, the, uh, 
you know, something other than expected value in terms of, um, and so, uh, you know, I've done some research where the agents are loss averse, where they're risk averse or risk seeking. Um, all of those are now, you know, reasoning over the full distribution of outcomes. And so, you know, I think um, some of Mark Bellamere's recent research on, you know, dist uh, distributional RL is, is nice and can be used for that. Um, it's all, you know, but it's all about, um, you know, I think there's two challenges. One is, learning the full distribution of the effects of your actions. And then the other is, you know, uh, defining the function that you want to use to optimize or that you want to use that to optimize. And, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, this is, um, it really just depends on what your, what your objective function is. But yes, yeah, so, so we, we it, it, the research, if I think about, you know, the research where we've taken this into account the most, um, is is in the sort of auction based setting where we have trading agents and they have to you know try to you know not just maximize income but but try to um you know maximize the probability of doing better than the other agents in terms of you know and, and uh this came up in i think we had uh a paper in jair back in 2001 on the trading agent competition where um it was a, a competitive scenario where you're trying to do better than the other agents in in principle you're all bidding for goods and you're trying to get the most money but but it doesn't really matter how much money you have at the end it matters that you have more money than the other agents and so you know that written uh, reasoning about you know risks and probabilities came into you know a lot of um, played very very heavily into there. reinforcement learning in some sense though inherently also deals with you know um you know there's the, the classic domains of the of an agent you know not walking along a cliff because it's risky, but you know, the cliff, cliff walking grid worlds or whatever, um, even the expected value captures some notion of risk there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when you run, when you want to try to, to, you know, do 95% above a threshold or, you know, outperform other agents, then, then it's, it's actually changing your objective function. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But none, none of the, none of the robot, robot skills that I presented here explicitly reasoned about risk. They were just trying to find that high expected value policies. Um, perhaps I can, uh, uh, just a quick question about the, uh, I think it, it was just, you mentioned it in passing about the uh, traffic intersection where uh, I guess cars were communicating with each other and uh, arranging for uh, for a safe passage mm -hmm. um, so what was that uh, like uh, resulting in a higher throughput uh, than you would oh yeah by far like orders orders of magnitude well the the, the not throughput the, the measure we looked at was called delay which is like, you know, how long does, if, if a person, if a car is driving from one side of the intersection to the other side of the intersection with no traffic and a green light, how long does it take? And how long does it take with the, you know, traffic signal or stop sign or this intersection mechanism that I showed? And we got order, orders, I think two orders of magnitude less delay using this mechanism than traffic signals and stop signs in, you know, in, in, the, first, uh, in the first paper that we put out. Um, it's a JAIR J article in 2006, I think, uh, with Kurt Dressner as the, as the first author. And, but yeah, and we've also measured throughput. It's definitely better throughput. We've measured uh, how much fuel and emissions usage it would, you know, how much fuel usage and emissions you would get, um, you know, from these different, from the different trajectories that the cars would take. And so, yeah, there's big, there's big improvements. Yeah. So I remember I had the two master students uh, that uh, we did uh, like simple reinforcement learning on a single intersection. And you get like 30, 40 percent improvement. Uh, yeah. In uh, like well, throughput delays, everything, but not not, not two mm -hmm. times. <laughs> yeah. That's impressive. Uh, the, the, you know this this particular one. I mean, yeah. In in the most aggressive settings, where the you know the video I showed you, the cars were getting very close to each other, and you know you'd have to have perfect control to be able to do that. But then, yeah, we get huge improvements in delay. We've been looking at now. We just had a paper in the Amos conference last week on one of the, the, the um, sort of the flow system where you have, you know, the flow from Berkeley where you have like, you know, a, a bunch of cars in a, um, they demonstrated on a ring where you have one car that's being controlled by a reinforcement learning agent trying to keep the traffic going as smoothly as possible. Huh. And they show some really nice demonstrations there. We've been now extending this to open intersections where there's, you know, you have um, cars, you know, just 
traveling through and emerge um, or and larger intersections like you know a lot with lots of lots of junctions and inter interstates and things like that but using you know reinforcement learning to try to improve traffic flow in those kinds of settings um, and get, we got some some interesting results that we just presented at Amos last week yeah, I mean, it might still be re quite relevant even with autonomous vehicles because, I mean, there, there were studies showing that actually autonomous vehicles is going to increase usage of cars. Yeah. So you might even That's see right. increasing traffic. Uh, That's right. Um, well, if John and Vincent don't have uh, an, uh, some other question, do Vincent have um, a question? Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the, the nice talk. Um, yeah, I have, I have uh, two possibly a bit naive questions, but I'll go forward. Uh, I was looking in at the paper on grounded action transformation, and just to make sure, mm -hmm. uh, is the, uh, the paper you have with Farshi on grounded simulation learning, is it another word for the classic model-based RL, uh, uh, just uh, in another community, or, uh, or is it, no, uh, what, I, am I, what am I missing? Uh, uh, there, that's my first question. And I'm going to tell you my yeah. first, second question, uh, otherwise I'll forget is, uh, I feel um, I, I don't read very often about learning inverse models in RL. Uh, maybe it's, it feels, or maybe it's just what I've been reading lately uh, has not been in there. Or is it not mainstream or why, if so, why is it not uh, more used in the community? So that's maybe a, also a wrong assumption I'm, I'm stating here, but uh, definitely I haven't been reading much uh, RL paper with uh, this sort of uh, inverse model learned along the way as part of the algorithm. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, so the first question, yeah, the, the first paper on grounded simulation learning uh, was, yeah, that, that you found that, that sort of introduced the concept and, um, and uh, it's the same idea that I showed here in this talk. We've got the best results when we improved the method to use this grounded action transformation function that I talked about. But, um, but no, it's not the same. I don't think it's exactly the same as model-based reinforcement learning in the sense which, which I showed during the talk. It's, you could, I mean, you could make the simulator just be a model. So then, yeah, then it is, would be model-based reinforcement learning. But the idea here is that the, we have a parameterized simulator um, or we have, you know, we have a simulator, um, and we want to try to improve it. Um, so, you know, you can think of that simulator as the model, but in general model-based reinforcement learning, you're basically learning a model from end to end, from scratch, just state to action without any structure in the middle. Um, and, uh, and so I think, So it's um, a super highly structured model with all the physics. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. You can think of it that way. And, and so it's, and then it's a, um, a, a very constrained search through the set of possible models to find one that's reflective of the real world so that you can, you know, do learning there to, to help. But, but um, yeah, that paper, that first paper, but that was the, was um, the, um, a master's thesis that I think was really nice at introducing the high level idea, the general concept, but it's much more fully developed in the 2017 AAAI paper, the grounded action transformation. Uh, paper with Josiah Hanna as the first author, um, and that one, uh, you know, I think you can you can see the the, the formulation in, in much more, um, I think, precise terms. And then, with regards to learning inverse models, um, yeah, I think you're right. It's not done that that much uh, in in the in the reinforcement learning community. I think that's one of the that's one of the innovations of of um, well. Yeah, I've used it twice here, both in in um, in GAT and that's one of the main innovations of of RIDM or RIDM is that that it's um, that it is you know learning in this space of of um, of inverse dynamics models, which are you know in, in a sense you know a PID controller is an inverse dynamics model, so people use these, but it's in the classic um, controls community, not in the reinforcement learning community as much. And this is a way of, of leveraging that. Um, I have a whole other line of work on that's, that's uh, uh, with Shui Su Zhao as the first author called, called Adaptive Planner Parameter Learning, where we're basically, it's for motion control, robots navigating through constrained environments, where again, we have um, a black box 
well, not a black, uh, a, a motion controller that's you know part of the Ross control suite um, called DWA, tons of parameters. And the learning we do is to learn how to optimize the parameters of that controller rather than learning a model from scratch. And so uh, this is a theme that, that has been, I think, very useful in, in making things work on robots in the real world. Um, that is, you know, maybe less applicable to the kinds of things that people, you know, the main, you know, if you want to call mainstream right now is everybody working on Majoku or, or like, you know, where it's, I think less, um, I think, you know, you tons and tons of experience is cheap to get and, um, and the physics isn't quite real. So, you know, I think different methods tend to tend to apply, but I, I, I think, yeah, I, I would, I think people should be looking at these um, inverse dynamics models more because it's a useful function, right? If you, if you have a state that you're trying to get to, you're in a state, what action is it that will actually get you there? That's a, that's a, a useful concept to reason about, which I think is not, you know, typically, it, it, it is the concept of planning, but, you know, you know, this sort of reverse engineering, what would action would you need to take to get there? Um, but, but most of the, the RL literature so far has done forwards look ahead planning, right, as opposed to this backwards, backwards view. Cool. Thanks for the uh, for the overview. Uh, you're you're muted again, Hervé. Muted. Okay. Um, getting handle on this. Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> we'll have to <laughs> let Peter go. He has uh, yeah the next meeting just about now. Yes, so. I do. Thanks Thank very much. So much for. Uh, uh, yeah, visiting us. Thanks for inviting uh, me.